I was asked a question earlier this week about baptizing all the dead. Um, there's only one church that I know of that does this kind of baptism. It's the Mormon Church. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, I think it's called in America. Um, I know they've been doing it for quite some time. But um, somebody asked me a question about it and they asked me what I thought about it. So I had to explain to them. And after I'd explained it and they said, yes, that makes very good sense, I thought that would be a good idea to make a, a video of it, do it for everybody. So um, this is what it's about today. Um, as far as I know, um, the Mormon Church has been baptizing for the dead since 1840. And they've got something like 16 million members. That's what I've read anyway. Uh, but what actually does it do for them? Whether it saves their soul or not is questionable. Uh, whether it gets any benefit for them or not is questionable. But I'll read you what I read on their website, just briefly. Jesus Christ taught that baptism is essential for salvation and all who have lived on the earth. See John 3.5. Many people, however, have died without being baptized. Others were baptized without proper authority. Because God is merciful, he has prepared a way for all people to receive the blessings of baptism. By performing pro proxy baptisms in behalf of those who have died, church members offer these blessings to deceased ancestors. Individuals can choose to accept or reject what has been done on their behalf. And basically, that's what they say. Well, let's go and have a look at the scripture where they get it from. And, and then I'll try and explain to you what it means. So I'll go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. Else what shall they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not really rise, why then are they baptized for the dead? And why are we in danger every hour? Now that's the scripture they use. I've never seen anybody explain what it means except what I've read about this uh, baptism for the dead that the Mormons do, they apparently, they do it in their temples where they supposedly take the place of somebody and um, they baptize for them. The first thing that ought to come to your mind is, where's your two or three witnesses? Because the Apostle Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians 13:1. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So if I were to believe what they're doing is right, I would want to find other scriptures to back it up. I would also want to be sure that there were no other scriptures which contradicted. And this is where and this is where we go. So go to Hebrews 9:27, and I'll show you why I don't like the idea of what they're doing. As it is laid up for men once to die, but after that the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to those who wait for him, he shall appear a second time without sin for salvation. Now this scripture tells you it's appointed or laid up for men once to die, and after that the judgment. I don't know of any scripture where it says that a person who is dead can be benefited by something that somebody does for them while they're alive. I would like to know if anybody has a scripture, they can post it in your comments on the video. Um, I don't know where there is one. I've never seen it. And I've been reading the Bible for about 33 years. 
So that would be my first objection. Uh, you can't do anything for anybody. Once they die, that's it. The judgment is sealed, and then we have to go to the white throne judgment. So turn to that now. This is Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sits on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead in them, and everyone was judged according to their works. There's no mention of any reprieve here for anybody or any benefit by whatever has been done. It just says, whatever you've done in this life, your works that you've done, you're going to be judged for. These are the people who will um, be judged after the thousand year millennium, right? Um, and it looks like it's just a simple case of whatever you've done, that's what you're going to be judged for. It's not what somebody else has done for you. Doesn't say that, does it? Nobody else can step in your place. Though. Nobody else can step in your place. You're dead right. Let me give you some examples of why you can't do anything to save anybody once they've died. Turn to Galatians 5, verse 19, and we'll read a few scriptures there. Now the works of the flesh are apparent, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lack of self-control, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, selfish ambition, divisions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, let's examine somebody who's lived and they've been doing some or, or even one of these things when they've died. The Bible says those that do them cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So, what benefit is, is it if you get baptized in their place? Because um, they're still going to be judged according for their works, what they've done, whatever sins they've lived in. If they haven't repented of them and got rid of them before they die, they're going to be judged for them. Turn to Ephesians 2.8 now and we'll look at another example for salvation. For it is by grace you are saved through faith, that is not of yourselves, it is the gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So this scripture says you're saved by grace through faith. Now let's suppose you didn't have any faith and you died. Can something that somebody does save you or lessen your punishment after they're dead. If you don't got the faith, you haven't got the grace. Because I know Romans 5, 2 says you enter into grace through faith. So if you got no faith, you got no grace. Amen? Amen. Go to Romans 8, 9, and I will show you more scriptures now that are to do with salvation and I'm going to give you four scriptures that make it quite clear what salvation is all about and if you're serious about being saved then you need to make sure you know these scriptures and work at it because it's not automatic when you become a Christian that you get it all Romans 8 verse 9 but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not 
easy. So, if you don't have the Spirit of Jesus Christ in you, you don't belong to Him, you can't be saved. Go to 2 Corinthians now, 13, 5. I will give you a second witness. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Prove yourselves. Do you not fully know yourselves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you are rejects? The King James says reprobates. I'm not sure what the New King James says. What does the New King James say there? Disqualified. Disqualified, yeah? In other words, it's fairly clear. If Jesus Christ is not in you, you are lost. Okay? Go to Colossians 1.26. And we'll see another one. Colossians 1.26. The mystery which was hidden from the past ages and from those generations but now has been revealed to his saints, to whom God wanted to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the nations, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. During the past time, even the time of Moses under the law and things like that, it was not revealed to them that Christ in you was the way to salvation. They very often tried to be justified by keeping the law, uh, making animal sacrifices when they missed out. Uh, but Hebrews 10 says the blood of bulls and goats don't take away sin, so uh, they were never able to stop sinning. And this was the problem in the past. But this scripture that we've just read, Colossians 1.27, says Christ in you the hope of glory so again him in you is salvation him not in you isn't I'll give you one more turn to um, 1st John 5 verse 11 and this is the witness that God has given to us eternal life and this life is in his son he who has the son has the life and he who does not have the son of God does not have the life. So if you don't have that Spirit of Christ, the Son of God in you, you don't have eternal life. There's no way you can get around it. I've given you four scriptures there which prove it quite clear. Now let me show you also from scriptures that um, there's nothing you can do to save anybody's soul in any way except you do it in this life while they're alive. Um, I'll give you an example. If you minister the gospel to somebody, right? Can they be saved? Yes. Okay. If you don't, and they don't hear the gospel, will they be saved? No. If you minister the gospel to somebody who's dead, can they hear it? No. You can't minister anything to anybody who's dead. Once they're gone, they're gone. Okay? In fact, if you go to Job chapter 1, I'll show you some scriptures where uh, you can't impute your righteousness to anybody else. Let me show you. Job chapter 1, verse 19. This is what it reads. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young men, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. This was one of Job's servants who came to tell him about the disaster of his ten children being killed. Now, if you read earlier verses, which I'm not going to go into now, but you'll find that Job was continually making sacrifices for them in case they had some wrong thinking in their hearts. Uh, and Job, we know, was a righteous man, but his righteousness did not do anything to save him. I want to show you some more scriptures where it proves that your righteousness cannot be imputed to anybody 
uh, we, except for the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but I'll explain that as we go along. So I'll go to Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 17. Or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, Sword, go through the land, so that I cut off man and beast from it, though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord, Yahweh, they shall deliver neither sons or daughters, but they only shall be delivered. Verse 19. Or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast, though Noah, Daniel and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord Yahweh, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Now, you can also read a few verses before this. It says a similar kind of thing. It doesn't matter what the problem is that comes on the land. You will only deliver your own soul by your righteousness. You cannot deliver your children, neither son nor daughter. If you happen to be righteous and they happen to be wicked, they'll get punished. If they happen to be righteous and you happen to be wicked, They'll be saved and you'll be punished. You can't impute your righteousness to anybody else. I'll give you one exception. And this is uh, probably the way that we get the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to us. You're sitting listening to me talking to you today. And I'm, I'm explaining the scriptures to you. Now, we know what Jesus said. In John 60, 63, the words I speak to you, they are spirit. So, I am inputting my spirit into you. And you are therefore getting something from me which you didn't have before. And this is the way that Jesus imputes his righteousness to people by his spirit going into people. If you don't have his spirit, we just read you're not saved. But if you have his spirit in you, his righteousness is imputed to you. Because it's he's the one who gives you the righteousness, he's the one who gives you the faith, he's the one who gives you the belief. It's all him that's doing it through you. If you work a miracle, it's Jesus working through you. It's not, it's not you doing it in the flesh. Are you with me? Okay. Go to Romans 6 3 and we'll look at um, baptism and we'll explain to you, or I'll try and explain to you, what this baptism is about. Uh, baptism for the dead, I do not believe that's a physical water baptism uh, because water baptism, even by itself, doesn't save your soul. I know a lot of people who were water baptized who backslid and died unsaved. So it didn't help them. Every time you look at baptism, it's baptism, repent and baptism, or believe and be baptized, like it says in um, Mark 16, 16. Believe in, he who believes and was baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. So there's always something else you've got to put with it. Baptism by itself won't do it. I do know people that have been baptized in the past and they're just living like the world. You, you, you get baptized and live in the works of the flesh which you read, read earlier, they're not going to save your soul, is it? Because you're not believing. You're not going on to become like Jesus. Romans 6, 3. Do you not understand that as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, that even as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be annulled, for us no more to serve sin. For he who has died has been justified from sin. Now this scripture tells you what baptism is symbolic of. It is symbolic of death, burial and resurrection. Death when you go down into the water, burial when you go under the water and resurrection when you come out. Now Jesus spoke of this himself. Uh, if you go to Luke 12 verse 50, we'll see what he said there. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I pressed until it may be finished? Now, Jesus is not talking about water baptism here. He got water baptized by John the Baptist back in uh, Matthew chapter 3 at the beginning of his ministry. And when that happened, the Holy Spirit came on him at the same time and he was baptized in the Spirit. So he's now got a baptism to be baptized with. What baptism is this talking about? It should be obvious to you by now. He's talking about his death, burial and resurrection. That's the baptism that he's speaking of. So there is a type of baptism that we have to go through. And this is what we're looking at. There is another scripture which talks about baptism saving your soul, and it'll back this up. So I'll go to 1 Peter 3, verse 18. For Christ also once suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but he was made alive by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed in time past, when once the long suffering of God was waiting in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Which antitype, baptism, also now saves us, not the putting off of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now he says there that this is an antitype and the baptism now saves us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're saved if Christ is resurrected in you. Not the fact that Jesus was resurrected 2,000 years ago. If that was what it meant, everybody would be saved. Nobody would go to the lake of fire. Nobody would face judgment. The way Christ's righteousness is imputed to us is through his spirit coming and dwelling in us. When we become Christians, we become born again. His spirit enters in us. That's a gift from God. That's grace that God gives you to start you off. And after that, the thing has to grow. 1 Peter 2 verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. So you have to grow that spirit in you. You do it by meditating in the word of God. You do it by repenting of the works of the flesh. Because we read earlier, if you're involved in any of the works of the flesh, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. So this is a serious thing that we have to go along with. And what I'm saying about this baptism for the dead now, let me explain that. How is this uh, anything to do with baptism for the dead? Go to Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, but I live. No more I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, if you want to have the Spirit of Christ in you, like Paul, he says, I am crucified with Christ. What does that mean? That means your old man is crucified. This is the baptism that you go through, spiritual baptism, crucify your old man, 
Galatians 5.24 says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. So this is what it's referring to. Putting sin out of your life. Getting rid of all the works of the flesh. And when you die like that, and you bury that old man, Christ is resurrected in you. Right? This is the baptism that he's talking about. And it's the spiritual baptism that saves your soul. We read it earlier. Baptism now saves us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what it's referring to. Now, if you've ever tried it, or you've ever gone along this route, you'll find out this is a painful process. This is not a five-minute job. This is a continual working, working, working at it until you get there. Even me now, I've been a Christian 33 years. I spent more time repenting this week than I have for a long time because I did something in the flesh. And after I'd done it, I thought, you can't just keep living like this. If you make a mistake and operate in the flesh, that means the flesh is alive in you. So I had to get down and repent. And I'm praying God is going to get all this stuff out of me because I, I don't want it in there. Anything that's going to hinder me in my salvation or anybody else who listens to me, I'm just saying to God, I want it out. And I'm, I'm getting serious about praying and seeking God to do it. So Paul died to self. This is what he did. And if you want to know why he did that, why he went through all this process, go to Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you he has made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 5, even when you were dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ, by grace you are saved. So, who are the dead that Paul was baptized for? The people who were dead in trespasses and sins? How can he, why did he go through that process? Because he tells you in John 12, if a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, unless it falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So Paul went through the process of dying to self, uh, he went through the process of having Christ resurrected in him so he could bring forth much fruit. And that's what his ministry was about. It was about getting fruit, waking up the dead people. And we're talking about spiritually dead people who are dead in trespasses and sins. Go to Colossians 2.13 now. I'll show you another scripture. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So, this is the summary. The baptism for the dead, in my view, is nothing to do with water baptism. Your righteousness cannot be imputed to anybody, except you do it while they're alive and you input your righteous spirit into them. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to people when they get the word of God in them and they grow that spirit within them. This is how they get it. Now, in order to get the fullness of the spirit of Christ, you've got to die to self. So, baptism for the dead. Paul went through this process so he can preach to spiritually dead people who were dead in trespasses and sins and save their soul. That's what it was for. And I believe that's what Paul was talking about. Because if you go back to the scripture we started with, which is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. Else what shall they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not really rise? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why are we in danger every hour? What does that last verse tell you? That he was going through this process, he was being persecuted like crazy, and he was going through this in order to save souls. 
He said in one place, didn't he, that it, um, God blessed his ministry. Amen. He suffered for the sake of the body of Christ, yeah. he said in Colossians. So this is what it was about. He went through this spiritual baptism in order to save spiritually dead people. And I believe that's what the baptism for the dead is talking about. The problem is, of course, we have a lot of churches which always seem to uh, interpret scriptures in a carnal sense and they never look for the spiritual significance. But I hope that makes sense to you. And if it does, give God all the glory. Thank you for watching. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Click center to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Click top right to see more videos and go to our website to see great Bible studies, Hebrew and Greek word studies and lots more. God bless you.